live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering UiPath Forward Americas 2019. Brought to you by UiPath. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. This is day two of UiPath Forward. UiPath's third North America event, and we're excited to be here. This is our second year here. Daniel Denez is here. He's the CEO of the rocket ship known as UiPath. Welcome back to theCUBE. Great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Oh, so it's our, it's our pleasure, and it's been great to be able to document this. We've been saying all week that we see the ecosystem developing, the customer base at UiPath, path, very reminiscent of some of the very successful companies that we've seen, uh, but we've never seen a company sort of growing this fast. I have to start with, um, you are a big idea person, kind of go big or go home mentality, uh, but did you really see it getting here so fast? Well, we, we kind of see it a year ago, going yeah. here. I cannot say that uh, I've seen it five years ago. Yeah. Five yeah. years ago, <laughs> I couldn't see I couldn't see me even in front of a hundred people speaking, <laughs> not to talk about three thousand like it was today. Yesterday. Well, it's got to make you very happy. You said it up on stage is when you see your so the software that you developed. You're you're a developer. You're a coder, uh, affecting people's lives the way some of the, the yeah. examples that you gave. It was a little tear in your eye, maybe, I don't know what you're saying, but it had to tug at your heart a little bit. That's got to be, as a developer, and of course now CEO, um, that's got to be very gratifying to see your, your, your technology have an impact on people's lives like that. Well, I, I can tell you it is uh, really gratifying. In the end, it's, uh, we, we, we build technology, you know, to, first of all, we are proud as engineers to build the best technology that we can, but it's, uh, it makes us uh, a lot more, it's, it's a lot more touching seeing that you can help humans to become better, to become healthier, to even save lives, to help refugees. It's, uh, it's an amazing feeling. It's, when I talk to people about robotic process automation, most people don't, don't really, aren't connected. And they'll say things to me like, really, is there that much room for automation? Uh, we've been in the computer industry for 50 years. We've been automating everything, back office, front office. How much more room is there? And you put forth the premise last night in your keynote that essentially said that technology's actually created inefficiencies. Um, that no, despite all the automation that we've had, now we have all these processes that can be improved. So that's really the first time I'd heard that put forward. I guess my question is, so technology got us into this problem, can technology get us out? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'm a software engineer. So I didn't believe there are so many inefficiencies in, within the business world. I thought that large enterprises should have been automated completely. Everything should run as smooth as in a factory. But in reality, reality is far away from this. And as I said yesterday, email and uh, pro productivity tools, especially spreadsheets and line of business application has changed completely how we perform work in front office and back office. But uh, it's, a, it's a lot of scattered work because it's, it's work created when people build business processes. They work with different systems and they always touch the system by looking at the user interface, of the, by looking at human readable interfaces of these systems. And, uh, and when you go and automate them, it's kind of difficult to translate into APIs. So we are, uh, we are, uh, th that's the reality on the field. So our approach is just to replicate humans using the same tools, the same technologies that are familiar to business people building, and uh, it's the only way that can work at scale. 
Of course, you can take one particular process, build an IT project, throw developers to it and be successful. But you cannot do at the large scale that an enterprise has. It's the only technology that can work at the large scale. Like I believe in the uh, in transportation industry, self-driving cars are the only solution to that industry. Not, it's, it's not feasible to say I will build much larger freeways or, no, you will put self-driving cars or self-driving trucks driving in the night on the freeway and that, this is how you will free daily, you know, everything else for the normal folks. Agriculture, same sort of concept, yeah. right? There's not, you know, I can't make more land, yeah. right? But as you grow your company, um, you guys are growing so fast, are you able to use automations to you know, support that growth? I'm sure there are some inefficiencies in, in because it's just a pace of growth. Uh, help me understand this is, that. This is, this is our story. So we, we've built initial finance processes, finance, HR, procurement processes, in a very manual style, using people, and then scaling up, we reach a point where we become a big consumers of our own technology. It's not, it's not about, we use the most modern systems in the world. It's not about that they are not integrated. It's about all the, all the work built by these business people, all the reports that we are creating. All, all this stuff requires a lot of work. We have automated more than 100,000 manual hours within UiPath today. A modern company built on the best technology stack out there. Do you feel, feel like that's part of the reason why you've been able to, to grow so fast, maybe faster than other historical examples of software companies? Systems are one thing. We, we were able to grow as fast by a couple of reasons. First of all, we went global from day one. We, we, we are not the typical Silicon Valley company that says I will win in North America and then I will replicate this model across the world. Because they lose about three to five years in North America just trying to perfect the machine. At least. At least. Yeah. We just went, went globally day one. And it, our, it helps because we can make a business case easy. So we can, we can go into a large enterprise, show them how it works, and it, it doesn't require such a huge investment, at least to get started. And second, is it's about our culture. We put a big emphasis in keeping our culture customer focused, and we put humility as the core tenet of our culture. And I, I know it might sound a bit pretentious to say we put humility, but it's, uh, humility gives you a, a, gra a great framework of how you operate. Because you can, uh, it, it makes you listen to people, it makes you able to change your mind, it makes you actually accelerate. Because people that change their mind are able to find faster, better solution than people that are stuck and they need a lot of data until they make because they are afraid of losing face in making decisions. So, it's something that works. So, it, uh, it, these two things combined gave us the scale. It's very interesting you say that because there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Um, many companies have succeeded with an extremely dogmatic approach. I mean, I would argue Microsoft, much of its success was, you know, was built around personal productivity, Windows, and, you know, or bust. Um, yet your philosophy is be more open-minded, you're humble, listen to the customers, change fast if, if yeah. necessary. Kind of a different philosophy maybe than some others have, have used in the past. I believe that our philosophy is, uh, is helping us. I don't know, maybe at the, right, but Microsoft has changed yeah, a lot well, exactly. under Satya, yeah. so yeah, they, so it's, uh, it's not, uh, and I think 
this is this is built in the fabric of how humans operate. We talk to other humans, we learn their needs, and then we address their needs. I think it's arrogance to say, I know your path, I will do, this is what you have to do. Like many more traditional software companies are doing. We were very fortunate to build this product by listening to customers. That's, that, that's luck, you don't have to find product market fit. Listen to customers, market is big, bring what they want. Well, the funny thing is, you know, we talk about the analyst meeting, and I do remember you were there the other day. You said that you made a bunch of mistakes early on, that you got to have a build it and they will come uh, uh, mentality, you kind of built it, and then you had to go out, listen to people, and figure out how to apply it. Right? Actually, I've been using a lot of parallels to service now. It's kind of what Fred Luddy did. He built, he built a platform, and then the VC said, well, what do we use it for? He goes, I, I, anything. Yeah. And he had to go talk to people and figure yeah. out, okay, yeah. how to apply yeah. it. Yeah. But you said, well, you kind of made some mistakes early on, but you recovered from those mistakes by listening, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and I, you know, coming from a software engineer background, I, uh, I have, a, at least I had the tendency to don't give enough credit to sales, to marketing, and not, and not to even to the customers. Because we, we didn't really understand the customers. In the, so we, we built technology for the sake of technology. So we were really fortunate to have some early customers, but we didn't understand how. Because I thought that customers should owe to themselves to test and find the best technology out there and just go with it. I, I, I was really kind of, I had a lot of blind spots on how this world operates. But after I've started to visit customers and understand their pain points and their requests, I actually realized they are smarter than us in using our own technology because they use it in the real world. So that message, that, tra that completely transformed my thinking. So I went back to my engineering teams and I, and I tell them, guys, on this day, I don't want to ever hear we don't fix bugs and we do features and we do this. When a customer say you do this, you say thank you. Thank you for showing me the light. I will do this. That's, that makes me create a better product. The feedback is a gift. The uh, feedback is a gift. So, I want to ask you about the statement you made yesterday in your keynote about we are cloud first. And you, you announced uh, a SaaS capability today. I, I signed up, took me seconds. And now I got to do some work to invite some other people and start doing some automations. But when you were in your apartment in Bucharest or wherever you started the company, why not cloud then? Because most of uh, our customers are still on-prem. So we, ha we had to be where customers are. With the cloud first strategy four years ago, we wouldn't be here today. No, so we started close to the customers. We learn a lot from really large customers that are a bit more reluctant to go into cloud. And now, as I think all in, all in life is about timing. I think it's the right time, timing to penetrate the other segments of the market and offer automation on demand. Because the infrastructure price that people that are still on-prem pay are huge compared. Some, in some companies only to provision a server could be like 200K per year, per one time and then you have people to maintain them. Offering a many service by us in our own cloud, looking at the best, you know, we create the best infrastructure, most efficient, we have the best people understanding our technology, overseeing it, I think it's a great business proposition. Mm -hmm. But now we were ready to do it. And, uh, well, plus it sets up potentially new pricing models, you know, consumption-based pricing yeah. models. You hear uh, you know, a lot of a lot of ro a lot of bots uh, are are sitting idle. Yeah. Well, I, as a customer, hey, just charge me what I'm using. But like thinking of yeah. you know, serverless and of functions. Course. But this is possible only with the economy of scale. So. The cloud is, you're going to, your cloud. Yeah. Um, you're not going to build it on Azure or AWS or is you guys we use We use public clouds, yeah, okay. of so course. But it's we, just infrastructure. It's just infrastructure, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I got to ask you about uh, IPO. Yeah. Um, what can you share with us, your thoughts? You know, uh, the window seems to be closing a little bit, but different, right? You know, the Ubers and well, Slack, you know, not well, such a successful. What are your thoughts on IPO? Well, I think that uh, enterprise software companies were actually pretty successful in IPO in this year. And they have one of the, you know, largest multiples that yep. we ever seen. So you, you cannot compare marketplace companies like WeWork or yeah, Uber, yeah, Uber or right. Lyft to enterprise software. So I think that for a good enterprise software company, they will always be a place to land a good IPO, regardless of timing. Timing is, doesn't work for us. We are still, uh, we are still a young company. In many ways, we are a four years old company. So it will be one of the, you know, most earliest IPO. Very, yeah. Very, very early. We need a bit, uh, we need more, at least one year. Like, we won't do an IPO in 2020, but we believe that 2021 would be a good year for yeah, us. Yeah, it depends on the climate. But depends you're, on the climate, but you're, but you're very well capitalized. Right? It's not like you need to do it. Absolutely. For the, but the motivation and to do IPO. And we still have, Private, private capital markets are very frothy, so you can still raise a lot of money at very good uh, valuation. Right, so the motivation for IPO is is a, what? Awareness, maybe it's e awareness, exit for the employees? Yeah, exit for the employees, uh, and uh, you just get to a size where you cannot be private. And most of our customers are public, and they are much more comfortable dealing with the public company. Yeah, for sure, I mean, it's part of your transparency edict. But I mean, but a lot of companies that have raised a ton of dough, I think Cloudera, for example, waited and waited and waited, and then you know they go public, it's like the, then the public doesn't get to participate in the upside, so I'm sure you're having those conversations, yeah. thinking about it, yeah. but you know, yeah. the little guy wants to invest too in UI yeah. Path, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we want them. Yeah, why not, right? Yeah, why not? Yeah, so, it's good, it's, it's, it's very exciting times, and, and as you say, it's, it depends on the time, and we'll see what happens with the 2020 election, yeah. you know, who, can, who can predict those things. But so I want to ask you about the capital, because software is a very capital efficient yeah. marketplace, but, but we see companies, you know, you included, raising hundreds of millions, you know, sometimes billion plus dollars. Why such large raises? Where do you see that going? You mentioned engineering. You have plenty of money to do engineering. Is it really promotion, we, trying to get to we, escape velocity? We build a big market, and we have invested in a mode in order to, if you go fast, let's take a car, okay? The fastest a car, a car go, the more gas it consumes, right? So you need, if you want to comprise the time, it's costly. Yeah. But that helps you extend much faster, win, win large markets, and build a large, build really a large company in a short time. We could have been much more efficient if we, instead of four years, we would have built this company in 10 years. Many companies, if if they would reach our size in 10 years, they would still be happy. But we've done it in four instead of 10. And it, it was, it, you, you, have, you need capital to grow fast. So I, that, I think that's the right approach because I, I do think there's going to be consolidation in this market. And I think the company that mm -hmm. achieves escape velocity, and you are the favorite to do that now, will do very, very well. I think the market's much larger than the market forecast suggests. I think the TAM is way, way, way undercounted. I totally agree. And again, yeah. I, I, we called this on service now as well. We saw this early yeah. on. Yeah. At the core, people said, oh, the core is really not that big. Yeah. Uh, but but the but the adjacencies and the potential market is it's 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 way more than 16 billion or whatever that number yeah. you showed. I, I yeah. think it's 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 30, 40, you know, perhaps even even I bigger. Th I think as people realize that this is the really the only way you can achieve automation on this uh, smaller type of processes but at large volume, I think they will uh, th th they will go more and more. Well Daniel, I know you're super busy and you got to go. Thanks so much for Thanks coming on the Thanks a lot. It was really a, pleasure a pleasure speaking having you. again. All right, thank you guys for watching. Keep it right there. We'll be right back right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE from UiPath Forward 3. Right back.